Glad you guys have all made it here tonight. We're back in the book of Revelation. Uh, chapter number six is where we're going to pick back up tonight. We got almost all the way through Revelation chapter six this next week. So if you'll turn in your Bibles over to Revelation chapter six, um, we'll take a look at uh, what we've got going on there in just a moment. Um, we consider the great majesty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The lion of the tribe of Judah. And I don't know if you guys have ever went to a zoo and looked at a lion up close to see how amazing they are as far as what God has created there. And uh, we consider our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His great authority and power over this world. And it's going to be an amazing time as we see Him come and judge uh, this earth. Now, just as a reminder, um, we've already been through, of course, all these other chapters here. We're now in this third sector of the book of Revelation, those things that are happening in the future. And we need to keep that in mind. That's the perspective that we are looking from. And as we consider uh, the writer of this book being John, as he was exiled onto the island of Patmos, um, approximately AD 95 is when this book was physically penned. And so uh, God revealed Jesus Christ unto him um, there at that time. And so here we're going to take a look and we're going to get back into Revelation chapter number 6 today. We're going to be starting in verse number 12 as we begin our study. Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 12. This is the sixth seal being opened. The Bible says in verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Now remember, this judgment of God that is going to come is, is uh, being set up right now. God's wrath is not necessarily being poured out on the inhabitants of the earth yet, but the stage is being set for this. And as we read these words here and we take a look, you remember um, there was a great earthquake. Amen? We know what an earthquake is. We live here in Southern California, but this great earthquake is going to stir up this whole planet. It's not going to be an earthquake uh, felt in Long Beach and maybe throughout Southern California and that's it. This great earthquake that's going to come is going to be massive. And as we consider that great earthquake coming, the Bible says, and the sun became black. Some people say, well, is the sun really going to turn black? Yes, according to the Word of God, the sun became black. This is not a simile. This is a literal uh, description here. Now, it does say black as sackcloth of hair. If you've ever seen the deepest black color, um, that's what it's referring to here. But the sun is going to turn black. Now, what benefits are going to be poured out on the earth with a black sun? You think about this. Great earthquake. The sun's going to turn black. And the moon became as blood. The moon's going to turn red. The Bible says as blood. It's not going to have blood dripping off of it, but that's a simile. It's trying to give us a description of what it's going to look like. Has anybody ever seen a red moon before? It's happened. I mean, you can watch it depending on what's going on in the weather. You can look up and man, I look at that and I go, ooh, that reminds me of the book of Revelation. But I don't look up and go, ooh, is the great tribulation starting because you know what when the when the moon turns red as blood we're gonna we're not gonna be here amen um, but it makes me think of that verse number 13 of revelation chapter number six and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind once again we consider this the actual stars of heaven that God has spread out throughout the uh, heavens there. They're going to begin to fall and plummet into the face of the earth. We've probably uh, seen some things like this when we were younger. I know when I was younger, they used to have great uh, old black and white movies that were on about the big comet that's going to come and smash the earth and it's going to blow up. Well, you know what? The stars of heaven are going to fall as a precursor to God's wrath being poured out upon this earth. So a great earthquake is coming. The sun is going to turn black. The moon is going to appear to be red. And the stars of heaven are going to fall. And if we don't understand that well enough, Jesus gives us a description as a fig tree casteth her figs. You know, when people don't pick the fruit off the trees 
and it stays on too long, they begin to fall off on their own. And if you've ever been involved in a, in a big windstorm, a Santa Ana winds and such that come through here, a lot of times the fruit trees that have not been harvested in a timely manner, all of a sudden you've got all kinds of fruit all over the ground. And uh, before long, people are stepping in them and it's, it's becoming rotten and everything else. We consider the stars of heaven just falling out of the sky. This is a precursor to God's judgment as it comes upon mankind. Verse number 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. When the Bible here says the heaven departed as a scroll, the word heaven here, um, as it's described, is talking about the air. The sky, this heaven that's above us that we can see, it's going to look like it's being rolled back. God's going to be done with this place. The heavens are going to be rolled back as a scroll, the Bible says here. And the mountains, you even consider the San Gabriel Mountains that are over here to our north. You consider Catalina Island that's just right off of the coast and even Hawaii that's a little further off to the west and the Philippines and, and Guam and all these different islands. The Bible says that the mountains and the islands are going to be moved from their place. They're not going to be in the same place anymore. You consider the great shaking of the earth that's going to happen as God's wrath is about to be poured out on the inhabitants of the earth. You ever consider what people are going to do with maps at this point. I mean, you think about it. This is the great tribulation period, and the enemy Satan um, is working in and through the unbelievers that are here in the great tribulation period. And uh, they have chief captains and warriors and mighty men of valor and all these things that are going to be fighting against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you think they've mapped anything out on this planet? I don't know, in my military experience, people use maps and they look at things and they try and understand where they're going to go. And I think about how God shakes all of that up. And every map that they have, every plan that they would have that would say, you know, determining by a geographic uh, identifier like the Mount Baldy or Catalina Island, they're going to be gone. They're no longer going to be able to be referenced. You know, as we've moved over here onto this side, I used to have those San Gabriel Mountains to look at every single day. They seem like they're right in front of us. As I would travel where I was traveling to, um, a lot of times, and I know we're all like this, you look out for something geographically that can help you identify where you're at, especially if you're lost. And for the men here, we have a better understanding about that than women, because we get lost a lot. All right, And I'm used to looking for the mountains, but you know what, since we've been over here, I can't see those mountains over there anymore. And it makes me feel a little uneasy sometimes if I'm lost and I can't see a geographic identifier. And I wonder, this is going to be some time here for these ones that are fighting against Jesus Christ. Their whole world's going to be shaken up. The mountains and the uh, islands are going to be moved from their places. Verse number 15, and the kings of the earth. Listen to this group here. This group here is amazing to think about. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. You think about this great earthquaking that's going to happen, and every island and mountain being moved from its place, the uh, heavens being rolled up like a scroll, the sun turning black, the moon uh, turning red, and, and considering, man, what in the world is going on? The people who are living on the face of this earth at this time are going to see this stuff happening, and they're going to be scared like they've never been scared before. And you think about the mountains and the, the dens and the caves that are going to be formed as these mountains are crumbling and, and shaking about. Man, they're going to be looking for every single place they can hide to hide from the wrath of God. But are they going to be able to hide from Him? No way they're going to be able to hide from Him. It is not going to happen, but man, they're going to attempt to do it. And listen what they, what they say here in verse 16 as they look to hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, 
fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You know, this is the first place in the book of Revelation where I see the unbelieving, ungodly people recognizing that there's a creator of the universe. And it's when His wrath is about ready to be poured out upon Him. They see this great judgment coming. They see the stage being set, if you will, and all the things in our world being changed in a heartbeat. And they recognize this. And they know it comes from none other than God Almighty, the Creator of this universe. And they're so afraid of His wrath, they're calling out for their lives to be taken by the very creation that God has placed around them. They want to be done with it. They don't want to face Him. They don't want to see what He's got to say about their disobedience and their sin of unbelief. And it's interesting to see here, even as all these men here, kings, great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, uh, bondmen, free men, uh, pretty much everybody that's here right now that's the unbelievers as we see, uh, man, they're trying to get out of this place, aren't they? They want to even leave by, by allowing the things around them to fall upon them and take their very own lives. This brings us to verse 17 of Revelation 16. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Well, you know what? There's not going to be a whole lot of people that are going to be able to stand through this, is it? You know, when we consider God's great day of wrath, this is referenced in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 30 through 32. And really, Joel chapter 2, you can read the whole entire thing. But verse number 30 says this, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. We're going to see that remnant here in just a moment as we get to the second half of Revelation chapter number 7. But you know what? There is going to be salvation available for those living in the great tribulation period. There's going to be several here that are going to be witnesses for the Lord. And God is still going to take those that choose to turn to Him. We're going to see that in Revelation chapter number 7. The book of Zephaniah chapter number 1. Verses 14 through 18, once again, referring to this great day of wrath, the day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1, verse number 14, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men, shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath. A day of terrible and or trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloomness, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath but the whole land shall be devoured by fire of his jealousy for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land God's wrath is coming the day of the Lord is coming and we understand that as believers in Jesus Christ today, and we recognize that, but God's day of wrath is going to be like none other that we've seen upon the face of the earth. And so this brings us to Revelation chapter number 7. And so we can see here on our chart that we have, we've went through the first six seals that have been opened so far in this scroll. God's judgment. God's judgment is not going to fall until that seventh seal is opened. Now that comes in Revelation chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 1. That's where the seventh seal will be opened. This yellow highlighted area right here that we look at, this is the place that we find ourselves in Revelation chapter number 7. 
It's what some would describe as an interlude. It does not advance the narrative of Scripture or the timeline in God's judgment, but it yet gives us another picture into what's going to be happening during the tribulation period and in heaven at a certain point here. And so uh, it's broken up. Revelation chapter 7 is broken up into two different parts, if you will, um, in this vision that John has. Um, Verses 1 through 8 is going to be dealing with the sealing of 144,000 servants of God that are going to be there in the great tribulation period witnessing to those around them. And we'll see that. And then verses 9 through 17, we're going to see the arrival of multitudes of believers in heaven. We're going to get a glimpse into that and we're going to be able to take a look at that. And so as we move on here today to Revelation chapter number 7, verse number 1, the Bible says, And after these things, after the things that we just saw in Revelation 6, the, the six seals, after these things, I saw four angels on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. We consider the stage that's been set so far. The great earthquake, the mountains and the islands being removed from their places, the sun becoming black, the moon becoming red as blood, the stars falling from heaven, and the men and women scrambling to try and find cover from God's wrath to come. We see here that these four angels are here and they're on the four corners of the earth and the Bible says that the wind is stopped. Now, have you ever considered that? You know, you think about uh, this place that we live in on this earth and what's going on here. You know, we're on an axis. We're on an invisible uh, axis, if you will. We can't see it, right? But the earth is spinning around. It's just like we had a pin or a rod directly through the north and south pole, and the wind, uh, the earth is rolling around in a circle. Have you ever considered the jet stream on how God has implemented the wind on this earth? You know, what happens if you were to spin a top on a table? Bigger and bigger it gets, it's going to be generating a little bit of velocity. And therefore, have you ever been standing on the side of a freeway as all the cars drive by? And you can feel the wind going by from the turbulence of everything that's going by here. You know, wind plays an essential part in this world. It plays a very crucial part in our world. I'm going to read you a couple of things here about wind. Not only is wind in abundance, and it's an inexhaustible resource. We never run out of wind. There's wind always here. And you know, they say that um, even back uh, to 2000 B.C., human beings have been using wind for their benefit to live their lives. Listen, the Bible says this, or not the Bible, but this article here talking about wind says this, wind also provides electricity without burning any fuel or polluting the air. You've probably seen these big wind turbines around. Uh, They look like big propellers, something we use in our day and age. And man, you can do that without burning any fuel or putting any pollutants in the air. God's pretty amazing on how He created that. Um, I'm not going to talk about wind energy and all these different things, but you know what? Wind is an amazing resource and it's inexhaustible. Wind also has the ability to help move things that otherwise couldn't move around their environment on their own. Seeds are one of the most common things that are moved by the wind. In fact, the term animochery refers to the dispersal of seeds by wind. As God blows the wind across all the different plants and bushes and all these things, the wind is what carries the seeds that are going to reproduce those things to everywhere else to where they'll be planted and they'll be able to grow again. Think about the absence of wind and what it's going to do to the living plants on this earth, to the trees. Wind is a, also plays a very important role in aiding plants and immobile organisms and their seeds and spores and pollen and all these things. And all, although wind is not a primary form of seed dispersal in plants, it does provide for a very large percentage of that. Wind drive these seeds uh, around this planet and, and everything else, the pollen, uh, to help continue God's plan to be in effect. Remember in Genesis chapter uh, 1 and 2 and 3 and seeing what God did in creation as He created the plants. 
They have their own seed within them. And they're made to continue to reproduce on their own. And of course, human beings, we can help that. But man, without wind, it's going to cause a great problem for that reproduction cycle. Listen to this about wind. When the trees grow to a certain height, did you know that they would truly just topple right over if it wasn't for wind? Wind across the life of a tree helps the roots to dig down even deeper into the soil to to help maintain their stability. If there was no wind on this earth giving resistance to our trees, our trees would grow up and as soon as they reach a certain height, they would just topple over because they'd be top heavy. But the wind helps to strengthen them. It helps to uh, uh, make their root systems um, better and better so that they can stand um, against this, this very earth that they live upon. But think about it. Without trees being on the face of the earth, without them reproducing and growing, I mean, what great commodity do trees provide for us on this planet? Oxygen. <laughs> Right? Pretty amazing how God worked it out. They take in carbon dioxide and they emit oxygen. What a perfect plan, huh? But this perfect plan is going to go by the wayside as we get to the great tribulation period. And John here sees these four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, not allowing the wind to blow at all. That's, all these things that are happening here are miraculous, but to think about that, this place is still going to be spinning. But God is going to allow them to cease the wind. Pretty amazing. Verse number 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. We consider um, the uh, wrath of God that's getting ready to pour out and all these different angels that God has prepared to execute His wrath on this earth. John sees another angel coming and telling these other angels, just hold on a minute. Don't let things go quite yet. And you'll wonder why. Why would they be asking them to wait? Well, listen what the Bible says in verse number 3 of Revelation chapter 7. This angel is saying, hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And you consider that great event there. What we're considering here and looking at the uh, ones being sealed here to be used of God during the great tribulation period. Look what the Bible says in verse number 4 of Revelation 7. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. You know, sometimes we wonder why is, why is genealogy so important in the Bible? Well, I think right here is one example of that. The genealogy and how God shows us. And, and we can look here at, at Jacob. This is Israel. Amen? And Jacob had four wives, and these are his twelve children that he had here. Reuben, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun, and Gad, and Asher, and Dan, and uh, Nephtalim. Nephthal- <coughs> I'm going to mess that up. i got to... Naphtalim. No. <laughs> Alright, we'll have a tomato-tomato after this. Um, and Joseph and Benjamin. Amen. You guys think that's funny. I, that, I got a mental block around that name and I can't say it. And I was trying to say it in the mirror over and over and over today. And just kidding. I didn't go that far. But nonetheless, we can see here the, the 12 children of Israel. And we wonder as John is looking here and he sees this and he sees the number of them which were sealed and it was 144,000. And then that brings us to the question, well, who is it? Verse number five of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephtalim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph 
were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. God did this on purpose. We may say, well, why? Why did He say that over and over and over and over and over? We could know for sure who the 144,000 are based on this, right? It's a bloodline. It's the children of Israel. And I know we have Jacob that's up there on the board, but let me remind you in Genesis chapter 32, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And when we talk about the children of Israel, these are the ones we are talking about. These 12 kids that are listed right here that the 12 tribes were formed upon. And we will look at Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to read to you just a few verses here. Verses 22 through 28. And the Bible says this, And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons, and he passed over the ford Jabuk. This is Jacob here. And Jacob is fighting with his brother Esau. And Esau is coming after him. You remember the whole thing between Jacob and Esau and, and who got the, the birthright and all these things that took place. And there's great disparagement between the two of them. And Esau is after Jacob. And Jacob rose up that night and he, and he took his wives and his women servants and his eleven sons and he passed over for Jabuk. And he took them and he sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And so Jacob sends his brothers coming. He sends all his family and all his belongings over the Ford uh, Brook Jabuk here. Verse 24 goes on to say this, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And we've heard this part of Scripture here. As Jacob is there wrestling, uh, verse 25 of Genesis 32 says, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And so he's got a dislocated hip. How well are you going to wrestle with another man with a dislocated hip? Amen? Uh, not doing very good, I would think. But listen, verse 26, And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob, the one that God has called. Amen? The one that the children of Israel are going to come from. And here, um, he says, Who are you? Verse number 28 says, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. When you consider the meaning of that word Israel, the prince of God. Amen? And here Jacob's name is turned uh, to Israel, and that's where we understand the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's where we see in the first eight verses of Revelation chapter number 7, the offspring, the remnants of these ones uh, that were born unto Israel, their bloodline. Those are who are going to be sealed to go into the Great Tribulation period. 12,000 from each tribe. They're going to have a special place in God's heart as they go into the Great Tribulation period. They're going to be His witness. They're going to be His servants as they are there. And they are sealed with the seal of God. Typically, when we look at the old days, um, when you put a seal on something, it's really showing others who owns it. It's showing ownership. And God putting His seal here. And you know, you wonder why the angels are saying, hold on, hold on. We've got to seal God's servants before we move forward in executing God's wrath. God wants His people, His servants to be recognized. You know what? They're not going to have that wrath executed on them the same as the other inhabitants of the earth. We consider all these ones that are there running and looking to lose their lives. Not the 144,000. They've got a different mission. And God has set them to be His servants and His witnesses in this great tribulation period. Many of these 144,000, I'm sure, will become martyrs. Many in the great tribulation period will be saved and will trust Christ as Savior because of the word spoken by these, the 144,000, as they witness to people about who God really is. We take a look here. <clears throat> in verse number 9. But before we get there, I want to elaborate on this for just a moment. My first recollection of hearing anything about 144,000 anything came when I was a young boy in school. 
And I would hear other kids talking about this 144,000. And they were telling me, boy, these are the ones that are going to heaven. Only the 144,000 are going. And I always thought that was awful peculiar as a kid. Like, if God's real, I mean, why is He going to close it off after, after a certain amount of time? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, this is the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses. They, for years, proclaimed that only their group, those that had uh, arrived on the scene, those that have uh, established great works within their movement, would be able to take the slots of these 144,000 in order to go to heaven. But you can see, based on what we just read right here, that doctrine in itself is so far out of line, there's far more going to heaven than 144,000. This 144,000 is representative of God's servants that are going into the great tribulation period to be witnesses for Him. But yet they grabbed onto that and they used uh, Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 4 um, illustrating that and trying to get their people to do uh, what they want them to do so that they might get a seat in heaven. Now if you want to see something interesting... Oh, only look at this if you want to see something interesting, okay? You can mark this down here. I don't know if I gave this to you guys as a slide or not. This is a YouTube link right here. This YouTube link goes to a title that's called this, 8-11 Former Jehovah Witnesses Testify. And it's an old video. It's from the early 70s. And you'll have a group of people that are standing there. And you know what? In the beginning, now these are people that used to be Jehovah Witnesses. But yet they will still sit there and you'll see them begin to bicker and argue with one another. There's a lady on stage that says this, I'm, I'm one of the 144,000. And one of the guys says, oh yeah, you are. Well, when did you find that out? And she said, well, 1965. And he just laughed. <laughs> 1965, I know you're not one of the 144,000. And then a daughter on the very end begins to chime in. And man, when I found out my mom was under the 144,000, I cried because I thought my mom would be taken from me and she's going to get to go to heaven and I'm going to have to stay here on the earth and, and all this nonsense. Watch that video. It's something interesting. It's false doctrine that's being taught by the Jehovah Witnesses. And I'll tell you this, this is a real complicated chart about their doctrine. It takes Matthew, um, the book of Matthew, chapter number 13, as Jesus deals with the sower, the seed, and uh, they take this so far out of context. And I'll say this, in their early on doctrine, you can see right here, it says 1919. You know that by 1919, all 144,000 seats in the Jehovah Witness movement were filled in 1919. Man, what are they going to do now, right? Well, nobody figured that out for a little while. Not until 1934. In 1934, they started taking tabulations of their, their roles and those names that had been entered into that list of 144,000 and they realized, oh, 144,000 has already been filled. Now what are we going to tell people? Well, in 1935, the man that was running this movement, he made this determination. Okay, if you come to know um, the Jehovah Witness faith as your faith, and join Kingdom Hall after 1935, you're now going to be one of the ones that will stay here on earth when time is all up. You've heard them say, we're going to inherit the earth, right? Th those are the ones. That's where that came from, 1935. But if you became a part of Kingdom Hall before 1935, and you were deemed to have one of the 144,000 seats, then you would be destined for heaven. Pretty crazy, right? That's false doctrine. And we can see here very clearly in God's Word that it's 12,000 from each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it has nothing to do with going to heaven on a permanent basis. It has nothing to do with salvation. And you know, we, we think that different groups, just because they'll mention the name Jesus and they'll, they'll talk about church and different things, boy, there's a lot of places they do not believe about the Jesus in the Bible. Amen? Nor do they believe the Bible. And I'll say this, we've already taught on Bible versions here and talked about the King James Version Bible being the best English translation of the Bible. Uh, the Jehovah Witnesses use something that's called the New World Translation. It's one of the most egregious modern translations out there in terms of changing Scripture and omitting verses from the Bible. It has 14 different places in that Bible that they've just completely taken out because it doesn't align with their teaching. And they've changed plenty of other places in Scripture as well to match up with what they want to teach their people. We need to be aware of that. Amen?
And so we see here this 144,000 um, that are uh, sealed. They're going to be God's servants, God's witnesses um, as they make their way here into the tribulation period. That brings us into verse number 9 of Revelation chapter 7. And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. We see these ones in white robes that have now made their way to heaven. This is a glimpse into heaven following the tribulation period and those that were receiving Christ during this time have made their way to heaven forever to live with God for all eternity. We're going to look further in to this group, this multitude in white robes next week. And we'll share much more Scripture about that to understand and be able to understand, you know what, there will be people saved during the Great Tribulation period. This right here, seeing these, this great multitude of all nations and kindreds and tongues arriving on the scene in heaven in white robes is a partial fulfillment of the Great Commission for us as human beings to be giving out the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it even extends into the Great Tribulation period. Even though God's wrath is being uh, going to be uh, executed here on mankind, God still gives them time to turn to Him if they choose to. But we know how it goes for those that are lost and those that are unsaved. And the Bible says even about this time, the Great Tribulation period, even if the very elect were able to be swayed from what they believed and who God was, man, there's going to be some horrific things that are going to cause people to think in some sideways terms when it comes to the Great Tribulation period. And you think about these 144,000 witnesses. I think there's going to be scores of people saved during the Great Tribulation period. The Bible here says to us, a great multitude which no man can number showed up on the scene in heaven wearing white robes. I think there's going to be lots that are going to turn, but I think there are also going to be many, many, many souls that are walking upon the face of the earth that are going to choose to continue to rebel against God. And they're going to know they're up against something that they can't even compare against. But you know how deceitful our very own hearts are. They've already desired to have the rocks and the hills and the mountains fall upon them for they knew the wrath of God was coming. I could see them just waging war in an all-out manner against God knowing it's all or nothing and it is going to be all and they are going to leave with nothing. Destined for that place called hell. Cast into outer darkness. It's an exciting time to see here in the book of Revelation the great tribulation period as it's getting ready to approach. But keep in mind, these things that we've read through so far are just setting the stage for that time. This earthquake, the sun becoming black, the moon becoming red as blood, the stars falling from heaven, the mountains and the islands being moved from their places, the kings, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, the bondmen, the free men, everybody seeking for caves and dens to, to hide themselves in from the wrath of God. And as we get through this next week and we see this great multitude in white robes, we'll get into Revelation chapter number 8 where it starts off by saying there was silence in heaven for the space of about 30 minutes. You think about that. You think about as a great storm comes, as a great hurricane comes, as earthquakes. I don't know if you guys have ever been up just prior to an earthquake, but there's almost like a stillness and a calmness that comes about. The, the birds that are normally chirping in the trees get quiet. The dogs are no longer barking. I mean, there's a calmness. And I consider this as we get through this Revelation chapter number 7. It's almost like being in the eye of a storm where it's all still and it's quiet. 
And God's wrath is getting ready to be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth. Let's consider this as we go through this next week. That time is short. We don't know how long God is going to allow for us to be here doing His work. I would hate for God to have an appointment set up for me where I decided that I was going to be busy about doing something else and choose not to witness to somebody. Or that I allow their, um, their words to be so egregious to me to where I'm going to say, eh, I think I'm going to pass on this one. This guy's being a little bit too aggressive. Or, or they're making me not feel so good. It's making me feel bad in what they're saying. We can't rely on our feelings. We've got to do what God would have us to do. Amen? And so as we go out this week, remember that time is short. And we need to do everything that we can to get the Word of God into people's hands so that they can trust Christ as Savior before this time arrives. It doesn't matter who they are. There's tracks out there in our track rack as you leave today. The very last table on the right, grab some of those and pass those out to the people that are around you this week. They need to hear about Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the truth of Your Word. And we thank You for the encouragement and the motivation that You give us as we study it and as we, as we see things unfolding. It's hard to comprehend the great wrath that You are going to pour out on this world as we get to these very end times where Your final judgment on this earth is going to come. Lord, we pray that You'd help us to be Your servants doing Your will. Help us to be motivated by the time frame that time is short. Help us to have the words to speak and the courage to hand a tract to somebody, even this week, so that they might come to know You as Lord and Savior. Lord, we love You so very much and we thank You for Your watch care over us. Bless as we go throughout this week. Help us to be able to clearly identify those divine appointments that You have set up for each one of us in here tonight. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.